Right, you've been quite good to all the people that love hearing about bookies doing their money. You must have some good days as well you can tell us about. Yeah, there's been, there's been good days along the way and uh, sometimes uh, things have gone, have gone right. Uh, and I've been fortunate through, I suppose, through having a decent clientele. Occasionally, um, you know, things fall into place. Um, with regards to uh, backing horses, um, I was very, I was lucky at the beginning, shortly after I started uh, uh, m making a book on the rails, um, a little while after, uh, I got uh, somebody that started to do a card for me, a form card. And uh, uh, there's lots of form cards out there, but this guy was meticulous in his approach and he was very, very good. And that guy's name was Dave Roberts who was later employed by people like Tony McCoy and uh, many other jockeys. Uh, and he set many other jockeys um, on the road to success. But prior to that, I employed him. I employed Dave Roberts to do a, to do a daily card. And his card was accurate. And if he, if he liked a horse in a handicap, so for argument's sake, if I was then on the rails later that day and the trainer then wanted to back it or the owners, then I've got Dave's, Dave's uh, form uh, uh, appraisal uh, pointing towards it and I've got the trainer and the owner say, say uh, backing up that. So then I would maybe double or treble up on that. And, and, and I remember one also, Goodwood one day that Ellsworth was trained David else would train it, and he hadn't done much in three runs, but David put a comment on the card to the effect that, you know, the minute there's any money for this horse, it can do a lot better than what it's it's shown so far. And lo and behold, uh, someone from Ellsworth's uh, yard yeah, wanted to back it, and because uh, that, that indicated to me that this was, um, this was the time for me to make my move, and that was a, a 12 to one chance, and uh, I backed that to win, um, you know, quite a few thousand, and that and that duly won quite easily. Uh, following on from that, uh, later a horse called Tyrol um, that won the two thousand guineas um, was trained by Richard Hannon, and uh, it went into the winter uh, a thirty-three to one chance for the guineas. Well, I don't really know why it was thirty-three to one because I think it had won a Grade One or a Grade Two as a two-year-old, but it was. And uh, Richard Hannon had three horses in the uh, front betting for the 2,000 guineas. One of them, I think, was second favourite. One of them was about eight to one. And the third of these was Turo at 33 to one. But um, uh, Richard was keen on, uh, was keen on, keen on Turo's chances. And um, through, a, through a mutual friend, this, uh, this information filtered down. At that sort of price, I thought, I'd take a chance with it. And um, I backed it to win about hundred and twelve thousand pounds during the winter, and um, and that duly obliged. And curiously, uh, uh, Pat Henry wanted to ride it, but Pat Henry was committed to uh, he was uh, at a stable at, at a uh, contractual commitment to Khalid Abdullah at that time, so he couldn't ride it. And he said to to Richard Hannan that he he he, he recommended a jockey that. Uh, not many people had heard of uh, at that time because that was Mick Canane who turned out to be one of the best jockeys um, of the last few years and uh, he, he, he rode Tyrrell that day uh, and that won at 33 to 1 so that was um, that, that was very good um, there's been some other good time the uh, some good mainly coming from I like to think that I was some sort of judge watching the races and um, I bet uh I backed a horse one day with Michael Simmons, another Rails bookmaker. Um, he was uh, he was quite a character, but a big layer. And I watched a two-year-old win a maiden race at Ask, uh, um, uh, owned by Sheikh Mohammed. And um, I'd won a few bob that day. And as I was walking off the course, I, up track, I said to Michael Simmons, what price? In this for the uh, thousand guineas, and he said eight to one, which looked 
bit thin really considering it had only won a maiden, one maiden race but I knew that uh, uh, Willie Carson had rode in and I, I knew they thought a lot about her so uh, I took a chance at a 40,005 with Michael Simmons and um, she started about evens on the day. She actually just got beat but, um, but the fact that she was evens on the day I'll never forget that day because the first two bets I laid at that new market, I laid Hills even 10,000 and Labrooks even 10,000. So as soon as I'd had eight to one for 5,000 pound, that book looked quite pretty. But I must say that for everyone that, look, everyone that looks like that, there's plenty that, you know, that are ex-certificate and that you shouldn't let children under 16 look at because they look horrendous. So it's not, all, it's not all milk and honey, but there are good days and there are bad days. Um, some you get, I get you get a fondness for some race courses over others. I always liked Salisbury. Always thought it was a friendly place and a, and a fair running place for fair running track for to introduce two year olds. Always liked Salisbury. It gets a bit slippery if it's wet, but a good cover in the grass. Mill Reef made his debut there, incidentally. Um, other tracks I really like York. I like the way the the, the 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 older I get, the more I like York, which is one of the few places I'm still operating at. I, I make a book at every every meeting at York, um, and I still operate at Newton Abbott, and I've got a soft spot for Newton Abbott, another friendly, well-run course. Uh, Pat Masterson that runs it, another became a friend of mine, another very nice chap, knows what he's doing, made a good job at Newton Abbott. Called York is run by essentially is a run run by a race club, rather than an overtly commercial concern. It's essentially run by Lord Halifax and his pals, and um, York's run on that basis. And I think York gives fantastic value to money for the customer. Uh, fantastic uh, running surface. They they put a lot of effort in at York. They give the customer what they want, and they don't overcharge. And there's a lot of race courses that do overcharge could take a leaf out of York's book and see how successful York are. Uh, and to, to put that into context in numbers, when Asker, who know how to overcharge, when they, when they run their, one of their uh, stellar days of the year, which is the King George, on the same day York has a day with a handicap as the leading uh, race of the day, as opposed to the King George at Asker, and York will, will, will probably attract three times the number of um, customers that Ascot will. So that's really a poor reflection on Ascot as well as being a good reflection on, uh, on York. And, uh, but York offer value for money, so I, that's another track I always liked. Uh, I, I don't dislike any of the tracks particularly, where I don't like, this, I don't like what they've done at Kempton with the I don't like all weather tracks. Um, but most of the tracks, they're all idiosyncratic. They've all got their own um, their own uh, quirks. I like faking them. It's a long ride to get there, and as I'm driving there, I always think, what am I doing going here? When I get there, I like it. Similarly, Ludlow, that's in the middle of nowhere to some degree, but that's also got its followers, toast of these places. I like them all, really. They've all got their own... Um, their own. Oh, Wing Canton, I always like. It was a poor viewing track. But the, the, the catering was good there, so I like that. Uh, I've never won there, of course, but I like going there. Um, I finished up with the number one pitch at Wing Canton. That was mainly due to the others. It was a bit like the, um, uh, uh, I suppose it was, the, I was just the last man standing there. I became number one because uh, uh, the other bookies, a lot of them fell by the wayside. Uh, Stephen Little bit on the balls there. Uh, some of the best bookies I've known, that would be a good question. That would be one of them, Stephen Little, a fantastic bookie. Another good friend of mine, nice chap. Uh, John Banks, a great bookie. Uh, Jack Cohen was always entertaining, a good bookie. All these were people that I learned from uh, and tried to uh, take the best bits of their acts and um, sort of incorporate them into my own. Um, Stephen always said, I don't bet on anything that talks. And although I haven't necessarily adhered to that uh, pearl of wisdom, um, I think it's quite a good, uh, quite a good basic for a, a budding bookmaker. If it can't talk, then uh, it's it, it it will help you. If it can talk, it can be it can, it can be fixed. In other words. 
So you're talking that now about anybody that's interested in sort of starting. So obviously it's been a massive change since you first came into bookmaking, which you sort of touched upon. How do you feel about how it all is now? Well, it's it's become sanitised and sterile, I suppose. It's just like there's a, a special health and safety uh, 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 government body now been... Um, now I've been drafted into bookmaking, that's how it feels, because there's really no risk element, because what the bookmakers have become is really sort of um, sort of agents for the betting exchanges, if, if, you, if you're honest. The days of the gambling bookmakers and the days of bookmakers making the markets, in those days someone had to make the odds, and you know, you had people like Baker and Martin in the silver ring that would price up 25 runners without blinking, Eddie, Eddie Avalon, um, uh, Eddie Avalon down in the West Country always priced up first. Dave Sapphire in the South put the price. Now the prices are all made for them. They're pre-made for them by, by, by the betting exchanges. And then the uh, the betting percentage is pre-made, pre-manufactured for them by their by their computers. So really, it's it's not as exciting a business. It now lacks all the characters. It now there are now aren't any tic tacs. So that's a, another element that's been removed. So it's become sanitised and sterile. And in days of in days of yore, um, with unraced two year olds, uh, if if you had a a, a message for an unraced two year old, you look in the paper. It might be eight, ten, twelve to one. You'd go to race course, and there'd be a fair chance you'd get a decent price. I'm not saying you might get twelve, but you might get seven or eight. But now, of course, with the advent of the betting exchanges, etc., by the time by the time um, uh, nine o'clock in the evening comes, uh, your your eight or ten to one chance is now is now nine to four. So there's that, that that I think mitigates uh, against uh, you know punters making their way to the track to try and get a bargain, and when you look at the prices on course now they're more or less identical, and again that really and they alter almost they alter they alter the prices alter almost in tune because the bookies are working in tune with the um, with the betting exchanges. So I think there's a lot of the. Of the colour and the intrigue, uh, uh, and the attraction really has been removed uh, with the advent of the electronics and the betting exchanges. It's never going to go back, and I suppose new people coming into it who don't who, who don't remember the days that who don't know about days I'm talking about, maybe they don't know any different. But for me, it looks a pale. Today's betting market, race course betting market, looks a, looks a pale substitute for the one that, that I frequented for 30 or 40 years, yeah. So how do you see the future of it? That's a very good question. Um, it, it's the, the problem the bookies face is the ever-increasing um, expenses. They, don't, they, don't, they are always going to increase but the stakes seem to really be, if anything, decreasing. Uh, you know, my av the average stake for most bookies at ordinary tracks, I think, is going to be around about 10, 12, 15 quid. Um, and if they don't take enough bets, well, then basically the sums don't add up because the expenses, are, uh, as I say, are ever, are, are ever on the increase. So it's, it's not a particularly rosy picture. The other thing that I would like to see addressed that won't get addressed is the fact that on most race courses, it's all very well for the top, say two or three or four uh, pitches, or maybe six or seven or eight pitches. In some cases, it could be a dozen or 15 or 20 pitches, but all the poor pitches, they seem very, very badly dis, um, disadvantaged against the, against the top pitches. And the thing that aspiring bookmakers would do well to keep forefront in their mind is that the expenses are all the same. So whereas if you trade in Oxford Street, you'll pay three thousand a day rent, but if you're in uh, if you're in Bangor High Street, you'll pay thirty quid a day rent. On a race course, you all pay the same. So you pay the same for the number one pitch as you pay for the number thirty-five pitch. And I think that. I think that is off-putting to people coming in, coming into the into the business. 
Um, I think they're better off with a lower number of decent pitches. I think in t in t over time, the numbers of pitches will diminish. It will diminish, not increase. And that's reflected in the current values of the pitches. The top pitches do command top money, but uh, pitches that are maybe 15 or 20 numbers down that list, they can be worthless. They can be worthless. So that's really, that's really the best indicator of uh, the shape of uh, the shape of things uh, as they stand at the minute uh, in the future it doesn't look wonderfully rosy to me i think people will still continue to go racing but the other thing is people handle cash a lot a lot less these days so uh, we're going i don't know about a cashless society but we've now got the um, contactless cards so people use those a lot for small purchases and uh, not so many people carry cash as used to carry cash. Another thing I found had an impact in the 80s and into the 90s was with the, with the changeover from people getting paid, instead of a wage packet, the money going into their account, that made a difference to book his turnover. If a man got his wages in a wage packet, he could be tempted to go to the race course and he had the money in his pocket if his wages, when his wages started to become paid into his bank, then it was different, we had to go and take the money out, it was a different thing. That had an impact in the 80s, definitely. We didn't think about it at the time, but it did. But now with it being largely a cashless, or going towards a cashless society, it's, I think the bookies will have to adapt to take, the, to take these contactless cards. And I've seen one or two bookmakers that you're taking contactless cards, and I suppose that would be that would be a way, that could be a way forward. Could be a way forward. So if you have been watching this, um, back when you were determined to be a race course bookmaker, <laughs> back in the day, would you have watched this and thought, oh well, I'll go and work in a bank, or would you have thought, I'll find a way of it proving this bloke wrong? Which way would you have thought? <laughs> oh, because I'm stubborn and stupid, I would have carried on. I, once I did develop the idea to do it, I was definitely going to do it. Uh, should I have done something else? Well, there's always an argument for that. Um, but I've enjoyed it all. Uh, it's only recent years that I've become, I wouldn't say disenchanted, disappointed is a better way. I was disappointed um, with the betting exchanges. I don't think it's added anything. I think it's to the punter's detriment, the betting exchanges, as much as it is to the bookie's detriment. Because if you analyse it, all that's actually happening is that each time a race is run, a percentage of money is taken out from the total field money in, 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 to form the, uh, the, the Betfair Commission or the Betting Exchange Commission rate or bet that Commission rate. So each time a race is run, whereas before the money stayed in the centre, all the money stayed in the middle, now, every time the dice are thrown, three or four or five percent is coming, uh, is becoming removed from the, mi the middle. And, and, and that's just to fund, that's just to, to, to make up um, the betting exchange profits. So I think that both the punter and the bookie are poorer with the advent of the betting exchanges. That money is lost, that money is dead. It didn't exist before. Right, last bit. So somebody's watching this, he's young, he's enthusiastic, he wants to be a race course bookie. Now, is he going to find a way or is he going to listen to you and think, oh, the game's gone? I heard that phrase 30 years ago, by the way. <laughs> well, I would definitely be saying that, but uh, it depends how de determined is. He might diversify into other things. You know, there's now... You know, there's this great growth in online betting, but if he if he's determined to be a race course bookmaker, I think I would have to try and deter deter him. But in my mind, I think well, if he's young and he's keen and he wants to do it, he'll have to get on with it and find out for himself. But because the game that he's going into is different to the one that I was going into, I felt the one I was going into, a, a man did have a chance. You know, if he had some ability. Uh, and 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 a bit of uh, an ability to take risks, an ability to master the figures. I felt that he could make a go of it and make a living out of it. Now that same young person, he's going into a business with a completely different set of ground rules. 
So it, it's a it's a hard thing to say. I I would try and deter him, but it, they still go ahead because it it always looks like easy money to the outside. They always think, oh yeah, well you just just chalk up a little bit bigger prices and you go home with all the money, but because it does not always quite as simple as that. <laughs>